we got a good show for you guys today because for this interview, we are joined by none other than one of the most interesting and incredible individuals you'll ever meet. And I'm not just talking about all his tattoos. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to the one, to the only, Mr. Noah Hathaway. God, Noah, it is a genuine pleasure. Honestly, well, do you not, I was gonna say, do you not have a, oh, no, your mic's right there. He's sitting on it. Yeah. Sitting on it. It's, it's sound your butt. That's true. What do you do with that butt, though? But say, is he coming, is he coming through, Scott? Hello. Oh, there it is, there it is. Yeah, there we go. A little te technical difficulties. Uh, Noah, how's it going? Good. How's day two treating you? It's been mellow, you know, it's not crazed, but it gives me a chance to, uh, to talk to people, which is kind of like, that's why I do it more. Sure, sure, it is. I mean, it's about the conversations, you're getting an opportunity to know what the 417 kind of has to offer. Well, also, the never-ending story, just uh, it, in itself, the people that it's touched, they're so, I mean, they're so varied, there's three or four generations, and it's 40 years old, you know, next year, mm. so. It's a lot of people uh, that have seen it, and a lot of people have, have really had this uh, like a close connection to the Never Next Door, more than almost any movie I've seen. Well, and like, I mean, you know, no pun intended, but it truly is a never ending story. It's lasted, you said, like, what, 30 40 years? 40 years, 40 years next month. I mean, it could be next year. I mean, four generations, and still, I mean, I just saw the other day, it came back on Netflix. And yeah, we happen to drop another ad for it. It's just, it's truly just incredible just how, how long a timeless story can like truly touch so many generations. But we had no idea. I mean, we, we had no idea until I had gone over to Germany to do like the final screen test. But I knew, I knew that I had the part finally because I, I auditioned for a year. They had uh, a different director than Wolfgang Peterson uh, uh, slated first and uh, I guess he just he was fumbling the ball. They did like a you know a worldwide search for the kid, and after like six months, I got the part. And then they they canned him. They got Wolfgang, and they did the same thing all over again. So finally, yeah, after a year, went to Germany, and they were like, oh, you got it. And, and I was like, about time. I just want to stop auditioning because if anybody knows about auditions, they're just they're just a horrid experience. You know, you're just sitting in a a room full of people that don't really care about you. They just want to fill the spot and do their job, and yeah, here you're trying you to do your best, and, and you know, like half the time nobody's even looking. Bury your soul, like the most vulnerable uh, situation you can find yourself in. I've had a couple of those interesting ones. <laughs> like, I, I screen tested uh, for the champ, me and Ricky Schroeder, and I was like, oh, let him go first. And then I saw, I had never seen somebody squirt tears out of their face, like, and I, I go, I should have gone first. Because <laughs> I got that like one little like teardrop and he was just score like, yeah. So, there's, auditioning process doesn't lend to like be really creative, creatively fulfilling. They, uh, they just sometimes want to see that you can make some changes and make them and, you know, I don't know how much rhyme or reason is, is, uh, <laughs> is in the whole casting process, but yeah, it was a long drawn out thing and then, um, they were gonna make me green. So the screen test day, they painted me this horrid goblin green. Because the tray was green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not like an olive green, just like, just. No, it was just, it was green. And I could have seen really having PTSD and being green for a year. But I think they wanted like cute little, you know, yeah. So I went to the tanning salon instead, <laughs> twice a week, so that I looked more Native American. I'm Native American, I was like, oh, okay. More Native Americans. Yeah. yeah. Germans are going to so tell me Native more American Native American for you. Yeah. Right. So. Well, speaking on being vulnerable in uh, the, kind of the acting space, I mean, you're no stranger to that. I mean, you've been doing this since you were roughly three years old, correct? Yeah, I got my SAG card in 1974. So even before you know, SAG, I mean, you were doing commercials. <laughs> you were. And then you I were, was working before SAG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And then even Battlestar Galactica with your father. Yeah, my dad did one episode. He was a. Uh, he was an acting coach, and uh, uh, I, I, a struggling actor himself, but he was really good. He just, he had had polio, and, and it, it's really hard being a disabled actor. They don't want to cast, you know, they, I get it, though. You know, you, 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 it's hard to cast somebody with a, with a, 
disability to play whatever role. The, you, you just, you know, your job is on the line. Too. Sure, sure. So he kind of, uh, he got kind of pushed off the sides. But yeah, he was. I've seen a couple of the things he did. He was, he was great. You know. So it was his, his that was his thing. Uh, and I guess what you can't do, your kids are going to do. Sure, yeah, yeah pick, pick, pick up where they left off. Right. So would you say that he was a big inspiration to kind of why you decided to get into showbiz? Well, I don't know in three how many choices you had, but I couldn't, you know, decide what underoos to wear at three, so. Well, I'm thinking uh, like three years old. I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking about acting or anything. Yeah, I, mean, I barely yeah. learned how to not shit myself. Pretty close. To, yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, just, I, I, I remember um, I did a campaign for Pepsi, was like the first thing I did. I did a couple of them. Um, I've done a lot of Pepsis, Jesus, I just thought about that. Um, and that was like the first, I was a Kennedy kid, and uh, uh, yeah, it just kind of went from there. And, and from Star to Battlestar Galactic, I think it was like two years. And then I, I did Battlestar, and that was kind of like the opening the floodgates a little bit to a career, which at six years old sounds weird. Oh, it's so <laughs> surreal to imagine like where where I am and then where I'm sure a lot of our audience members was at six years old I mean again, I can't imagine doing anything short of basic life experiences right. not pooping myself Whereas you already an on-screen actor at six years old. Yeah, and and It was it's a lot But I was already for some reason um, I was like a little old man <laughs> So they, they actually my nickname was the 40 year old midget Sorry, the 40 year old little person, but it was a midget, so it was me. I can say it. Uh, they'd be like, you know, how sets are cussing, and sure, kind of, you know, the rigging lights, and so they'd be a big horn, and they'd go, 40 year old midget on deck, watch the swearing, <laughs> and they'd have a swear jar. And, and uh, God, I bet, oh man, I bet you filled that one. Me? I was, that the, one who, I was the one who. Uh, I've always had a. Crap. For some reason, I'm imagining just a just a smaller version of you, tattoos and everything. Six years old. That'd be funny, though. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, it was. It was. I, I basically got a chimpanzee, the Pampers, and that was my first day of work. It was here's this chimpanzee because it was a Daggett suit. A little girl named Evie. She was incredible. I mean, to think she had this silver jumpsuit they stuffed her in, and then they velcroed all the pieces of the Daggett suit around her, and there's no air in there, and so she would, you know, between takes, they'd take the helmet off, and they'd try to fan her, and she'd just be dripping sweat. Almost never messed up any takes. Like, Richard and Dirk used to screw shit up all the time. She was great. Like, you know, they were just haters. But I had a great, you know, I had a great time. Um, Lauren Green was, was mad cool. He used to run lines with me in the mornings, and he was like, you know, they didn't, the guys didn't want anything to do with a six-year-old. They, you know, they're on a TV show, and you know, ladies' men, and so, so, so he was like, like my grandfather for the for the the whole the whole shoot. Well, so cool. becoming famous at like such a young age. I mean, like adults that are now famous and famous celebrities, they go through all the time about how you know there are certain aspects of being famous that are just far less glamorous than it seems from the outside. So being as famous as you were at starting at such a young age, I mean, was there anything that was uncomfortable or maybe Lots even resented? Yeah. Kids are kids. You know, kids can be really cool. So I got bullied like a lot, uh, which was weird. I went to a private French school, and I had like little French kids bully trying to bully me, which was just kind of weird. And again, my like pre-existing like notion of you as a six-year-old or younger, like again, like <laughs> such so a mini version, still built tattoos and everything. It's like wild to imagine anybody it bullying you. Didn't last for very long. I, I begged, I first I wanted a box, because I knew like, something about boxing, and then it martial arts, because I'd already, you know, know Bruce Lee, and, and um, so I begged my parents, you know, come home with one uh, one or two extra black eyes, they let you go to martial arts. So then when I stopped getting, stopped getting bullied, but it went through like high school, I couldn't even go to, I went to, I went to, so I went to the Lycée Français, which is like, you know, all the celebrity puts their kids there, right. It was a it's a crazy school. They they were they got they got in trouble for buying grades way back in the day, and, and uh, it was an interesting school to, to go to. Um, but th yeah, I mean, I lost train of thought. Sorry, it's a long weekend. Oh, it's this here bullying. Yeah, I I just um, 
the kids are cool, and, and uh, you know, I, uh, that was the biggest thing. I mean, through high school, I got really bullied. Well, they tried, I mean, I'd, I'd come out of class and some football player would crack me in the back of the head, and there'd be a fight on. So they sent me to continuation, and I was like, well, uh, yeah. So just because any time I'd show up to school, there was just beef, there was just problems, and it's just people get jealous. Because you were an actor, because you were in like... Well, taking it, you know, if, if you were the captain of the football team and somebody shows up and there's like a five-page spread in the yearbook, like color, I, I had no idea. I showed up first day of school and there's like a whole spread of me in the, in, 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 you know. And people really, don't like, you didn't people ask don't like when you take their shine, you know what I mean? They get shitty about it, so. But I, I've talked to a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of actors, even an adult, you know, and as adults, people get, you know, they don't like when you're... We're more successful. Yeah, more. I heard a great, I heard Deion Sanders say, don't let my confidence mess with your insecurity. Like, I'm, con like, that, I've well, always I, been that way. And I think that's purely where it comes from, like, insecurity. Yeah. I mean, you, they see you, I mean, you know... Insecure least... knuckles hurt just like secure knuckles <laughs> do, though, so... Yeah, so now I'm, I've always been kind of like an advocate for anti-bullying, and I, I always try to, I always root for, and, and try to help, you know, the underdog, quote unquote, or somebody who's not as strong as the next person. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been that way since I was a little little kid. Maybe that's kind of the, the bullying shaped me into that. Because now that's, I mean, yeah. Well, when I, when I talked about in the intro that you are, you know, literally one of the most fascinating individuals, at least I've ever met, and I'm sure a lot of the audience can agree, uh, I want you to stop me uh, when I've got it all. So, uh, we've got you as a super sport motorcycle racing. I used to. Taught advanced jazz and street dancing. I used to. Studied multiple martial arts and has black belts in several. And I too. And you helped teach a close quarter combat training course for flight attendants and pilots. <laughs> <laughs> I did. We, he was supposed to. He, my, my one of my grand my senseis. He's a grandmaster in uh, Shaolin Kung Fu, but he's a white dude, which that's a big, yeah, you know, I'm big deal. When, out of when he was, he did a couple tours in Vietnam, and he lived on a, uh, a Zen monastery in Hokkaido, Japan, for like five years, just because you know he didn't want to come home. I don't blame him. Uh, when 9/11 happened. I came to the, the dojo the next day, and they were putting together a, fus in, a fuselage in, the, in the, the gym. I was like, what the hell is going on? And we trained Sky Marshals for a couple months that were, yeah. And it was no joke. Like, <laughs> I got my jaw dislocated by one of the other instructors, and that's, that's what we, you know, <laughs> we did. But yeah, cool stuff. Well, and like, apparently, like, especially now, now that, like, we're... As a society, we uh, always have our phones on us, like, yeah. very easy access to recording. I never fully understood just how much shit flight attendants and pilots get, like almost on the regular. So Absolutely. when I saw that, I'm like, God, what an yeah. invaluable resource. Yeah, the, plus you have to know de-escalation, you have to, there's just a lot of stuff. And, and then you have to know when to turn it on and when to just, you know, that that's it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, when you're pushing to a corner, but like, you're right, you're right, like there's, I think a big thing that you probably taught was like, don't go straight from zero to 60, like, you know, use some de-escalation strategies first. Absolutely, you try that first, and when you, if, if you, you know, hit a wall here, you don't just keep hitting the same wall, you kind of go over here, and if that doesn't work, then you go to a thousand, and then it's just done. Well, so in studying multiple martial arts, I mean, there was several that you've specialized in, ones that you've learned, I was curious, why, what, 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 where stems the interest in martial arts to you? Of not wanting to get your ass kicked. Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, that's, that's a, that's, that's good enough in the inner setting. You know, that's a hell of a motivator. <laughs> it's not fun, you know, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was what was available at that point in, in, in life. I mean, if they, if I had known about jujitsu when I was seven, I would have been a Gracie, you know, or whatever, but uh, I didn't learn about it till I think it was 96 or 95 is the first UFC I saw. So it was the day after my birthday. I bought the I bought the package for my birthday so my friends could come over and watch this no holds barred thing. And when we saw Hoist Gracie handle everybody, we were like, what? And so you know, yeah, I, you know, studied with a couple of of, of interesting jujitsu full contact, you know, uh, Valley Tudo fighters. And I just I, I love that I have a lot of uh, 
like special forces buddies and a lot of um, fighter friends. And I think it's just because they're probably the most authentic people I know. Because you're not real with yourself and honest with yourself in their line of work. You're just, you're dead or you're seriously injured. And there's just a purity to that that I just don't find a lot of places. Um, and when you grow up in Hollywood and it's all smoke and mirrors, you, you never know who you're getting and what you're getting. And so, like, the guys that, you know, I hang out with are kind of like, I mean, what you, I you mean, know, you know is, if you're not a nice guy and you talk shit, you're getting slapped. Yeah, you're beat the shit out of you. Right, yeah. right. So you, everybody knows their, their place in the food, the food chain and, and, you know, you have respect for people and, and the way it should be. And, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not like that these days, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, looping back to uh, Never Ending Story, um, I'm sure that, you know, whereas there were uh, some less than glamorous spots, I mean, it's still an honorable role. I mean, to Trey you, you play oh, absolutely. one of the two main characters of, like, a major motion picture. The main character. Yeah, I, mean, I shot for a year, and I think Barrett shot for, like, three weeks or really? something. Really? Yeah, it was just a long shoot. Well, I, I was curious to ask, were there any, like, fun anecdotes or anything in the stories that you maybe don't normally uh, recount? I don't know about fun anecdotes, but I, I, I broke my back. <laughs> like, before we even started shooting, I, was, I spent two months in the hospital. So we were training on a, a, a horse that wasn't in the movie and shouldn't have been riding, and it got spooked and it was not staying in the stable, and it jumped the fence with me on top, and it didn't make the fence, and it fell on top of me five feet up in the air and broke two of my vertebrae, so I ended up in traction for two months, which is, that's fun. <laughs> it's just like a medieval torture rack, pretty much. So, yeah, it was a little freaky, because I didn't, you know, for a couple days, I didn't know if, if I'd ever walk again, and, and especially at that young age. That was my saving grace, is you're malleable, and, and I was really strong at that age already. Um, plus, it had been rainy, so I got, I got you know, I got snow angel into the ground, kind of. Okay. Thank God. Uh, so then I shot for a year. <laughs> and people go, God, that must have been fun getting blown out of the, you know, the tree. Oh, yeah. Once or twice. Yeah. But Wolfgang liked 40 takes every setup. And so that's hundreds of just falling out of a 15-foot tree. So, yeah, it was a very physical and a very emotional uh, shoot the, the, where our tax goes down that that scene took three weeks to shoot this is so you've seen that scene all right oh my God. yes yeah i just you never do that for three weeks never would have guessed it would have taken three weeks to i'm shocked i had hair by the end of the time oh real yeah so like watching it back speaking of watching that scene just watching the movie in general like looking at yourself <laughs> at young of age is that ever kind of like a surreal moment i, I don't watch it often uh, yeah, what? Well, well, I never got when people have like, oh, it's all my friends and have like a, I'm on an episode of Melrose Place. Let's everybody watch. That seems a little narcissistic when you when you say it like that. I've seen one episode. You know, I'd watch it once. I go like, oh, that sucked. I'm never doing that choice again. And I'd make some little notes, and that would be my. That's how I would watch something. I never really watched it to like as a movie go. Or I always watched it to go. Okay, what could I do a little better? What could I change a little bit? Um, bring a little more color to this character. So, <laughs> but yeah, have some fun ones. I mean, one, I did Sushi Girl in, I think it was 2000 so something, 2011, with Mark Hamill and Tony Todd and, and Danny Trejo. And uh, there was a screening of the never ending story, and somebody goes, Would you come by? And nobody knew. So we brought like a bunch of cases of beer and handed them out to the audience, and, and Tony Todd was up on stage, we reenacted this, this swamp <laughs> scene. So some of them was fun like that, but yeah, you know, like that, I'll, I've watched it, but it, I think I've maybe, I've seen it maybe four times. Four times total. Through. Yeah. That's weird watching yourself. You're critical, hypercritical. Sure, I get, you know, it probably takes you out a little bit of the experience, because like everything that we're seeing, that, you know, the fantasy of it, you know, like the ins and outs of like what actually happened. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I, that's the part I like about, I like the movie magic. So for me, what was special about making movies was they had to figure out how to make something believable that you had no idea how to do. So even just like in Star Wars with the, with the explosions, how they, you know, they shot everything from underneath, like it took some 
gnarly dude to figure that out. And it looks amazing, and everybody used it. So like the, the, the nothing, it was just these clouds. But it was just a water tank with some ink jets, and they just squirted ink, and it would roll, and that, that's what they used for the clouds. Like that, to me, is cool. That's what, like the exciting part of making movies was like that. And they don't do it anymore. They just hit a couple of keystrokes, and then you have something that you don't really connect with. Eh. Not so interesting. Yeah, it's just me. Well, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is probably the first thing people notice about you outside of, you know, being a major part of their childhood smile. and your winning smile um, is your tattoos. You're obviously a big connoisseur of tattoos uh, to the point that you actually became a tattoo artist. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk about you know, where did that stem from? Where did that passion come from? I can tell you exactly where it I was at an audition in the Valley in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, like by Universal, and that's where all like back in when I was growing up, that's where all the bikers were in the valley. It was a little more rugged than it is now. And I saw maybe 200 Hell's Angels come up on choppers and was like, what? And they were all rugged and, you know, faded tattoos. And I, I told my dad, I go, that's what I want to look. That's cool. And when, uh, around the time of, I think it was just after Battlestar, the, the Every Which Way But Loose and every this Clint Eastwood movies that he did with the orangutan. Same trainer as Muffy. So I answered the door, and it's him with CJ, which was the orangutan, had dinner at the dinner table with us. Like, the, yeah, so I, I just, I, that, I saw that look, and I was just like, oh. So, so being, kind of, being a San Diego, California native myself, I mean, I know exactly. In, I live in Mission Hills. For especially, a yeah, while. especially the area that I grew up in. Like, yeah, they were pretty prevalent. Uh, there would be, I'll never forget, there was one time we ate at a restaurant that, unknown to my family, was a big Hells Angels spot. Oh, yeah. And just the, mount, the mountains and mountains of bikes that would be there. And then we go in. And, but the thing that always surprised me some of the nicest people I would ever meet. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny how when you're really a tough guy, you don't have to act like a tough guy. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's you like could be it's... the nicest human being in the world, and, and that's your ass if you cross a certain line, you know? But... So that explains why you wanted to have so many tattoos, but then yeah, what made you want to go the extra mile and actually become a tattoo artist? <sighs> oh, I, I love, I mean, I always loved art, and I love... Uh, painting and stuff like that, so it, it just kind of, I just kind of fell into it more than anything. I just had people, because I was so tattooed, people were just always like, do you tattoo? Do you tattoo? Finally I said, yeah. And I had gotten my, I had gotten my ex-wife a tattoo apprenticeship, which 20-something years ago for a black lady was impossible. You just, they didn't give them out. Uh, but I knew, I had a friend who was a tattoo artist, and just through her learning, I, you know, she spent like, she spent like four hours with me apprenticing me, and then I just started tattooing. Uh, and I would say, as far as the celebrity tattooers go, I'm definitely the best one, because I've seen some <laughs> horrid, I would not let anybody, anybody touch me. I'm like a stick figure, maybe. Sure, but, sure. Uh, yeah, I do, like, I, I would do stuff that I like, like Japanese stuff, some flowers, like, you know. I was say, do you have a favorite that you personally have? Oh. You know, my dog's names are, are my favorite. Yeah. What was, I'm curious, what was the <laughs> first tattoo? Oh, I had a little, I covered it up though. This was a famous tattooer named Mark, Mark Mahoney in, in Los Angeles, and everybody goes to this guy. But he, his tattoos are super washed out. They look like they're 30 years old when they put them on. Yeah, he puts them on you. It's like my wife can't stand his work. But it's like a stylistic choice? He, yeah, because he, 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 he comes from like that, that Mexican tattoo style uh, of like the real soft gray shading, but he even took it one step further where he already makes it look like it's that old. And some of his pieces are awesome, but some of them are like, I want a fresh one. <laughs> but he just, he did like my Zodiac sign. I think I was like, shit, 15, something like 14. I just got the Scorpios and bolt and it's gone, it's been gone for years now, but you know, that was it. And I remember how bugged out everybody was. Because there was not one human being in Hollywood with a tattoo at that time. No. Kind of I like mean, a trailblazer at that point. I don't know about that, but everybody, agencies, I was immediately like called in for meetings, and yeah, that agent, that agency actually fired me for it. Really? And it was this big. <laughs> Something that could easily have been covered up with makeup. Apps, uh, app, which was the other thing. Is to find makeup to do it back then was almost impossible. So they, they had just came up with Dermablue. 
which was like the very first tattoo cover of me. And it was just thick ass. It's like, honestly, it almost sounds like it's taboo at that age. It, well, first of all, you're supposed to be 18. Oh. Second of all, <laughs> you know, I went from a Treyu to getting tattooed. And it, was, it just didn't sit well with a lot of people. They just, a Treyu doesn't get tattooed. That's rugged. That's, you know, it's still tattoos where like bikers did tattoos and, you know what I mean? Like felons. Like, 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 like Danny like, Trejo had tattoos. You know what I mean? Like, I guess, but like, you're, a, you're not a tray, you get trays that carry. You're no a half I know that. <laughs> they didn't know that. So, ah. Um, yeah, it was weird for a little while. And then I think people just got over it and then everybody's tattooed now. It's rare you see somebody that doesn't have one. Well, going back into acting. Yes. Um, you became famous at a very young age, and something that kept with you, you know, for the rest of your life. You're very, you go to all these conventions. Yeah. You're the household name. But I was curious to ask: Is there, at any point, that you kind of look back and think, if you could do it all over again, uh, maybe not not be a famous actor, but if you had a choice, would you have wanted to maybe have maybe a little bit more traditional of an upbringing, or were you happy with starting out your career at such an early age? No, I mean, I, I mean, hey, I don't, I don't regret anything I've done in my life. There's just regret, no regrets, you know. It's just like, no, yeah, there's just no time for it. Like if you're if you're doing that, you ain't busy living, you know. You regret your life. Uh, would I've done something differently from my life? Yeah, I would have chosen. I would have been in the military. Really? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't pass the medical because of my back. But my, my, uh, my uncle was a, a colonel. He ran the, the test grounds for the Army in Yuma, Arizona. And um, yeah, like I said, I trained. So I, I mean, I was, I'm a certified firearms instructor. I teach pistol and carbine. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Is there anything you don't do? Dishes. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> sure that goes, goes over well. Well, my wife doesn't cook because she can burn water. I've seen okay. that happen. And Something her and I share. Yeah, and I, my back's really kind of screwed up, so cleaning is just, when you're doing dishes and you're bent over, it's not good on my back, so she don't cook, I don't clean. Okay, so it's a good it works out, it sounds right. fine. It works out fine. <laughs> and what I cook, she, she can eat, she don't mind it, so. So I'd like to do a little bit of, a, that's actually maybe a, some of the less than glamorous spots of acting for our audience members, because lots of folks, whether unconsciously or subconsciously or consciously, hear these stories that you're telling and think, you know, maybe showbiz might be right for me. Maybe they've always aspired to be uh, actors or production people, something along those lines. And I was curious if you had any advice, uh, starting with rejection. Now, rejection is a big part of acting, a uh, big part of life, really, but, you know, your, your guys' industry does kind of seem extra, to be a little more practical. Extra. Yeah. If you don't have, if you don't figure out a way to compartmentalize that rejection, you're in for a long, long haul, because it's every day. I mean, you, you know, if you get 5% of the stuff, you're kicking ass. Like, that's just unheard of. So if you go out on 100 auditions, you know, you might get a couple of them. And that's just people know you suck. And it is, you go, don't take it personally. But it is personal. personal. It's me burying my soul. Like, it is. You're, you suck. We're not going to hire you. That's what it comes down to. I mean, I was going to say, we said kind of early on, I mean, you're put, going in front of a bunch of people that are really, they're here for one mission is to make a movie. They don't really care about you or what you're going through. And you Anything. have to bury your soul yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of auditions where you're crying and you're, you know, you're reaching for stuff and, and the lady's not even looking up. Just to... No acknowledgement reads like blah 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 like like a machine and gives you nothing. I mean, but that's sets like that sometimes. You you know everybody's got egos and you're on sets with other actors and you'll do your scene and you give everything you've got and then it's your close up and you know your co star walks off and goes to his trailer and you're like and some little little script girl is reading you know her little voice and you have to make that awesome. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that. So I think if you just if you just do you and you stay in your own lane and just worry about what I do, everything kind of <laughs> yeah, bit. yeah. Because I, you know, okay, well you don't want to do that, but that's not me. I'm gonna give you know I want the best performance for everybody. So you know I'm gonna sit there that extra whatever time, and feed you your lines because that's what you do. Well, that's great advice from a chiseled veteran of the industry. Is yeah. that? But is there any advice that you would? 
probably get, looking back, if you could go back in time and talk to your younger self, is there any advice that you would probably uh, give young Noah Hathaway in hindsight? <laughs> I would just, yeah, I was gonna say stay in school, but that's another, you know, we don't need to get into that now. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, when you're 18 and, and, and you kind of are at that point where you can make some intelligent decisions, then if that's what you want to do, awesome. I have a, I don't have a hard time with anybody's decision for themselves. I just, when, when I hear parents are like, oh yeah, I have my kids in the business and they're doing this and then and then, and I go, it, it never ends well. And it doesn't most of the time. I mean, look at the, the statistics. I have a ton of friends that I come up with that they are no longer with us, you know? And the list is, yeah, I mean, more than not. Is that just because the industry eats them up? They, well, it's a lot of it. Yeah. The industry, you have to be, you have to you have a real strong sense of self, I think, or you just, you just floating around kind of, you know, at, at what people think you should be or who you should be and, and you lose your identity and, you know, you, I always just said, I just never wanted to be a piece of shit, you know, and, and all the kids that I grew up auditioning with and all that, they're either so far gone that they're, you know, it's cringe, or uh, they're dead. And that's the, but look, you know, it's the it's truth. Reality of it. It's the truth of it, you know? Brad Renfro and Adam Rich, and like I could go down a laundry list of, of, of kids that I grew up with that were names, you know, talented, no? So kind of ex from what you experience now looking in kind of modern day acting in the industry, do you think it's changed in any drastically? Do you oh, think it had to. Especially now that we're accepting, you know, mental health resources as more, less of a taboo, less of a kind of a fringe necessity. Well, we need now. to do a hell of a lot more for, a, for mental health in this country than what we're doing. That's for damn sure. I mean, that's a huge part of why we're where we're at, you know, is, is, is it's not been addressed. Do so you think kind of as a society there's still much more we could do, oh. especially for our child actors? Not just childhood, for everybody. You know, the way we take care of our vets, the way we take care of our, you know, our, our mental health. It's, it's yeah, we, we got to step up the game a lot, because, I mean, that's a huge part of, of our downfall, I think, as a, as a nation. There's, there's a lot of people that, that need help and that aren't getting it and that have nowhere to turn to go to them, so. Well, it's, it's just so weird that we're making all of these medical advancements. There's, I mean, with, with physical health, but then yeah. so much so that that's we are, we're think. almost ignoring the mental health of our populace. Right, because you know, nobody wants to talk about the scary person in the closet. That, that's the one thing you got to deal with. It's you easier know? just to shut them up. Right, just medicate it. Like, perfect example, <laughs> my, my buddy did 22 years as, as a, a special forces operator sniper. Uh, one of the nicest, he like Captain America as Captain America gets. But they had him on 50 different meds for his PTSD. And they basically just want you just numb, you know, nothing. They just, you know, uh, uh, we talk you know, all the time and finally got him down to one. And now he doesn't take any, you know? I mean, it does hit other things to get to that, you know, stage. But yeah, they just want to throw him. They just, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Here's some drugs don't feel anything, and then don't bother us. It's kind of the mantra, which is, it's, you know, the opposite. You gotta, you gotta go right at it, and talk about it, and, and, you know, not everything is solved with pharmaceutical, that's for sure. So. Well, you and I were having a conversation, because you were clearly in a very good shape, both mentally and physically. And, and we were talking a little bit about Tai Chi, martial arts, and I was curious, like, what, what more could you attribute to say, someone else's personal health that they could take maybe a little bit more initiative on? Oh, you know, I, I, so like for me, if I don't stay physically fit, I'm not walking. I had to learn how to walk again, which was, you know, my life, my dog saved my life, is I was, I was having a real hard time. I mean, when, when all you, when you wake up and then you know your whole day is in pain, and you can take pain pills and just be a zombie, or you could not, and then you have to push through it and do all this shit to get there. That's hard, and that's hard to do every day. And so there was just, yeah, I was like, man, I just... And I, I got this French, I, I, this is 15 years ago, I, I got a French bulldog, and a piece of big sucker, and uh, never left my side for 15 years, but that's, he was the reason I got up and walked in, and I mean, I was in a walker, and, uh, I would tie each dog to the 
to my little walker with the tennis balls and it was just me, you know? I mean, I, I, I've been on my own since I was 14. I, got, I was emancipated and, and uh, that was t I was a grown up, you know, at, at 14. So I had no, nobody, you know, doing dishes and I had to do all that stuff by myself. So yeah, there were days where, you know, putting on your socks with the big pincer things, you know, because you can't, you know, yeah. It, it had, like, I slept in a lazy boy for almost two years because I couldn't lay down flat because the back was so messed up. I'll never sleep or sit in a lazy boy ever again. Oh, sure, I can only ever. imagine. Yeah, ever. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think different things become different priorities in your life when you don't, that thing is gone, you know? Uh, my dog became like, that was, you know, he was my, that was my, my partner in crime. Yeah, didn't leave my side for like 14 years. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, might not be somebody else's experience, you know, but I think you find whatever gets you through, that gets you through. Well, it's a whole journey, right? I mean, like this, these lessons in resiliency that you learned at a, God, a terribly young age, like too young, and especially for such formative years as well. Yeah. I kind of built you into the person you are today, though, I have to assume. <laughs> Jaded, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, what they, what they say, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So. Uh, that, it, it is true, and I, and I think you have to put, put your choice. You give up or you don't. You know, and, and uh, life has some wonderful, amazing moments, and it has rough ones, you know, which makes the good ones so much better. And it sounds like a cliche, but, you know, when you, you, know, you have to learn how to walk again, and you have all these, you know, yeah, you appreciate certain things. Well, let I me mean, say, it can be a cliche, it can be, certainly, but then, I mean, I'm looking at you, you're just, you're a well-rounded person. You're so freaking kind. I worked really hard at that. And my, my, I had a really hard, like, my mom, my mom was in and out of mental institutions my whole life. And so, like, I used to get the bricks beaten off of me on the regular my whole life. And so, uh, you know, you, you, those are the things that I wouldn't want for myself. And, and I would never, I try to be super kind and I try to be gracious and I try to treat people the way I want to be treated because especially in the business people don't treat each other like that people just walk over you and you know it, it's a weird crazy business wonderful when you're working and if you love that creatively wonderful but yeah it's a very unforgiving you cutthroat business well I mean one of my favorite quotes uh, from anything really is you don't get to choose what you start in this life uh, real greatness what you do with the hand you're dealt and I mean just it sounds to me that the hands you've been dealt were, weren't uh, the, the best, and yet here you are like, being an incredible individual, being an inspiration, not only to act, young actors, but really just anyone, whether it be through self-defense learning, uh, like positive mental health, it, it's truly remarkable. Thank you, I just, yeah, I think um, getting the shit kicked out of me one, one time too many forced me to look at exactly what I didn't want to become. And there was, there was a period of time where I was angry and bitter and, you know, I mean, every teenager goes through that despite of, you know, what they've been through. And I just kind of was like, oh, well, that's not who I want to be. And so I, you know, you have to take a look at the, at the, at the dark, wet, you know, closet and look at who you are. And, and I didn't like who I was in certain ways. And so I, I, I worked at it, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I much prefer people at least I much prefer myself. I try to be uh, helpful and thoughtful and try to, you know, I try to put people for, you know what I mean? I, yeah, so. But also, nobody gets, you know, there are no brownie points for getting through shit, like for grace, you know what I mean? Like, the point is, is just get through it. I always, I, people come up and we'll talk and they're like, oh, but oh, there's no dignity and I can't, I go, who gives a fuck? Are you, are you through it? Are you okay? Well, that's the point. Sometimes the only way out is through. Always, yeah. You know, you gotta go through. Yeah, you gotta go through trials by fire. Right? Well, I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for some audience questions. So, with a show That's of hands, awesome. if you have a question for Noah Hathaway, raise your hand, and I'll walk the mic to you. <laughs> we covered a lot. To be fair, yeah. To be to be fair, we went to a little bit more of a deep dive than just hey, I, oh, oh, got it right there. Um, so, for Never Ending Story, your scene partner was often a horse. Yes. Did you get really connected to that horse, or did you just she have any good awesome. memories? It was, a, it was a boy and his sister. It was a, a Frosty and Nellie. 
Uh, but Nellie was the main horse, and she was uh, a Welsh pony and an Ar Arabian, and so she was very lively. Uh, I really liked her a lot. We we had a parting of the ways. <laughs> They gave her to me at the end of the at end of the film that there was this, there was a disease like ransacking horses uh, around the same time, and they, we had to board her for like six months and, and fix her and all this. So we we left her with uh, the kid who did some of my stunt riding because he had a ranch out there. So she we we talked uh, maybe 15 years ago and he was told me she had a great life. She lived like way old for a horse. So I, I felt that was the best you know it was a, a good outcome. It was best decision. So. We, we had a good connection. She was sweet. If you have questions, raise your hand at this time. What was it like doing Twisted Tales? <laughs> I love Tom. We actually spent uh, last Father's Day at Tom's house with him, uh, Tom Holland. And we just, you know, there's certain people you work with and you never talk to them again, and there's certain people you, you kind of connect with. And we just kind of connected, and then after that shoot, we shot at his house. And he calls it his Chucky house. Chucky's, Chucky's no joke house, god damn. He's got like a tennis court and then pool and then it's, it's amazing up in, the, up in the, uh, the Hollywood Hills. So I would just go hiking with him because you know, he, he, doesn't, he was like, I don't have friends and I never get out of the house. And I'd be like, okay, well we're gonna go hike. And he's got, he goes, well my neighbors are Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson and that's it, the whole hill. <laughs> He's got like all these acres of hiking. I go, oh, let's go hiking. So we just we always stayed in touch. We shot that in a couple couple days. But I hadn't done anything. It's like 10, 12 years, and then I did Sushi Girl, and then I did four or five little things like the Twisted Tales, and then uh, <laughs> Blue Dream with Jimmy Duval, and <laughs> um, yeah, his it was like 10 pages of dialogue, and he goes, here you go, and I was like. <gasps> But it turned out all right. I wish it had gotten better, more play than it was, because it it, uh, it was fun to do. He's a great director. All right, we got time for two more. Does anybody? Yes. Hello. Um, in Never Ending Story, whenever you had to act opposite of like a creature, you know, that was like a puppet or things like mm. that. Was that difficult for you to do that? Or, I mean, where a lot of times was it not actually a puppet at all, but just a person like there to kind of, you know, for tracking your eyes and things right. like that? No, most of the time it was it was an animatronic. Uh, the Falcor was a 30 foot, they, <laughs> there was a bunch of Jim Henson's people under the stage, like, you know, pulling cables. It, it, was, it was pretty incredible what they did. And to get the lips and everything right, they just, there was no, instant playback you had to it was just like crazy what they did yeah it was yeah it was awesome i mean nowadays you have a tennis ball and i don't care who you are if you got a puppet that's you know verbally giving you your lie or you know your cues and stuff is a hell of a lot more interesting and and, and you know you get you got definitely more to relate to but i think you see the performances uh are real flat I haven't been to a movie in five years. Like, I mean, I was, there just hasn't been anything that I've been like, ooh, I have to go see that. Now maybe that's me, <laughs> but uh, I'm waiting for, you know, like a, a, a young Martin Scorsese to come start making some, you know, you need some real gritty taxi driver type movies and just, you know, not, they don't do that anymore. Everything's fluffy and, CGI, <laughs> but mm. actually, right, so we have time for one more question. Raise your hand. Oh, there it is. Hi, Steve. Uh, do you like Thai food? I do. All right. Uh, you're invited to Everyday Thai tonight. Oh, well, thank drinks you. on me. Oh. Um, but big movie guy. Grew up in a video store. Worked at a video store. And there are a few genres of movies that I personally like. Mm. What do you gravitate towards? Oh man, okay, so I'll give you like my top five. Clockwork Orange, Apocalypse Now, like The French Connection, uh, Up in Smoke. <laughs> that's my favorite credits of all time. And that's where, that's where David Fincher got his ideas for credits. And, and anybody says they're different, they're lying. 
because nobody had ever done like he did he graffitied all the stuff all the the credits on the car like that was this is brilliant um yeah those are like my top i, I like I, don't, I wouldn't call them action movies, you know what I mean? But I like dramatic movies that have little spurts of action in them, and I don't know whether it's just to drive the motor of the, of the film or just, you know, because that's what the story lent itself to, but yeah, it's kind of that, that type of, of style uh, of, of not a lot of specials, and if they are, it's practical. Like, I, I wrote a movie, uh, I think I'm gonna direct it this year. Uh, it's a coming of age movie, but it's it, it's a little rough. <laughs> and you know, we have one effect, and we have a car chase. And I was like, we're gonna do like a French Connection Ronin style car chase, like Smokey and the Bandit, uh, and do everything practical. And and the the one effect is is I haven't seen really before. So you know, I already talked to some my, my buddies got a shop, and I I told him what I wanted. He was like, yeah, we can do that. And the only CGI is just you gotta hide what they do, you know? So you just swipe a little here and there, and, but it, you know, just to take away, so you just don't see anything. So you, you're looking at it going, how the fuck did they do that? <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> so, you know, if I could not screw it up horribly, I, I'll, I'll be happy. But, I mean, it's a big, you know, <laughs> it's a little undertaking. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So you'll either see me like this or see me like, you know what I mean? It'll be one or the other. There's no, there, it's, there's no gray with me. So before we wrap things up, two things. Number one, uh, if you guys could all stay right after this last question, I would love to get a group photo of all of us. Uh, but number one, I wanted to ask anything you would like to sign off on with us on. No, any sage-like advice, words of wisdom. For me? Yeah, for Shit. you. Shit, you don't want to take any words of wisdom for me. I don't know, I mean, I feel like we got uh, plenty. Um, yeah, man, I just think be authentic is the hardest thing people you could do for yourself. But I think it's I think it's just I think it's the it's the hardest thing and it's the best thing that I try to do on a daily basis. And uh, you know, you're not not everybody's gonna like you and not everybody's gonna be your friend or want to be. But um, as long as you're just a good human being, you know, uh, yeah, I just say try to be as authentic as you can. I, I, I had somebody go, wow. Oh, you don't edit what you say. And I go, well, if I edited what I say to make you comfortable, then I'm not being honest. If you filter yourself, I mean, that's not your, right. that's not integrity, that's not you. No, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm polite, and I'm, I mean, I'm a little abrasive, but, it, you know, I, uh, I'm not an asshole, so I, I think it, the way I, if I'm gonna say something, I try to say it in a way that, that is authentic and explains what I'm trying to get Cross to you with as little ouch as possible, but sometimes you gotta, you know, you, you have to make your point pretty clear. But I just try to be a good human being, you know. We, especially in this in this time, uh, this is a crazy time. Yeah, you know. So I, yeah, I just, you know, it's it's gonna get worse before it gets better. So, so I'll hang in there and be authentic. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, just you know, be authentic. Because then if you're not, then you're living someone else's vision of their life for you. You're not living your life. You know, and then you missed it. Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Hathaway. Thanks. All right, so real quick, we all want to just kind of crowd around the stage. Uh, Scott, would you mind taking a quick photo? Yeah, I can do that. Here's what we're going to do, folks, once again. If you don't mind getting around the edge of the stage, we're going to have these two individuals kneel down on the stage. We want everyone else up next to the stage. If you guys don't mind doing that real quick, if you could, please.